Uh, uh, well, friends, I'd, I'd like to start off by thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. I've, I've really learned a lot. I'm, I'm a newcomer to this area, motivated by Sriram, as a matter of fact. So, so it's, it's really been an educative experience. Uh, I'm particularly delighted to be here because of uh, a very old friendship with Sriram. I think that it dates back to about 35 plus years. I've been good friends with both Sriram and Rama. And as many people have remarked, interacting with Sriram is a delightful experience in every sense of the word. I mean, it's delightful academically, it's delightful otherwise. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I guess his ever youthful exuberance uh, sort of uh, makes me think of him as a Peter Pan of physics. I mean, so, so, so Sriram, happy birthday to you. Uh, many, many long <laughs> years of youthful ex exuberance to you and don't change yourself, okay? Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, subject which I've developed some interest in, uh, uh, which is uh, the title is Cooperative Kinetics of Living Liquid Crystals. And uh, living liquid crystals at the outset, let me say, are uh, liquid crystals with uh, uh, active matter in them, basically. Okay, there's, there's been some experiments done over the last eight, ten years, and, and we, we try to create models for those, okay. Uh, let me name my collaborators. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a very bright student in Aditya. He's here and he has a poster outside uh, with several movies of coarsening and so on and so forth. And uh, my uh, other collaborator is Varsha Banerjee, who's a professor at IIT Delhi. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, here's an overview of my talk. I'll start off with an introduction, which will just make a few statements, which would be repetitive of what others have already made, I guess. And then I'll sort of move to this system of living liquid crystals. I'll talk about our Gisberg-Landau-based modeling of these systems. And uh, I'll, I'll then sort of after formulating the model, I'll study its kinetics, describe the phase diagrams, and so on and so forth. I'll just try to give you a flavor of what we've been doing. And then I'll end with the customary conclusion, okay? So I think we've already seen this slide 20 times maybe. We all know that active matter is an assembly of self-propelled particles, and uh, it consumes energy from its surroundings to move, basically. And so these are intrinsically non-equilibrium systems, which violate time reversal symmetry. And of course, fine examples are bird flocks, fish shoals, and vibrated granular rods. This experiment was actually done first by Sriram and bacterial colonies and so on and so forth. And of course, a sort of very important review on this subject uh, is by uh, the Dev Mod Physics article from 2013. And many of the authors of the review are actually in the audience. So thanks for a, a very nice review. Okay, so that's active matter. Uh, the second ingredient of my system is uh, liquid crystals. This is an even older and even more classic subject than active matter. And uh, a wonderful place to learn about it is this classic book by De Gens and Prost. This is, uh, for students, I would say, a very, very accessible, very readable book. So thank you, Professor Prost, for, <laughs> for putting it out there. Uh, it's called The Physics of Liquid Crystals, and, and there are several editions, I think. I, uh, the one I have is from 1993. And what are liquid crystals? Well, this is something we all know again. Uh, liquid crystals are sort of, at the simplest level, rod-shaped particles which have properties intermediate to those of liquids and crystals, hence the term liquid crystals. So at high temperatures, uh, so, you, so let's say you have a bunch of rod-like molecules. They like to align parallel energetically. Entropically, they like to point randomly with respect to each other. So at high temperatures, entropy wins out, and you have an isotropic liquid where the rods point in no particular direction. At low temperatures, the rods align, uh, energy wins out and you have a crystalline state. And of course, the state of interest in modern technology, well, one of the st states of great interest is this liquid crystalline state where on the average, the rods are aligned up, but the centers are not, uh, uh, don't have any positional order, basically. Okay, so that's, that's the liquid crystal system. And I'm trying to be a bit pedagogical uh, for, for, for students uh, in the audience, basically. Okay, so, so the system we're going to consider is, as, as I said, that of living liquid crystals. And these are pneumatic liquid crystals with active particles in them, okay? And these have been started to be studied about eight, ten years ago. And uh, 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 they sort of proposed to be of 
interest in applications involving mi microfluidic devices. Uh, so so the, some of the early experiments were on this kind of bacteria in pneumatic liquid crystals. Let me say at the outset that in these experiments, uh, the liquid crystal, uh, the active matter density was very low. So basically it was just the liquid crystal acting on the active matter, not, not the other way around. But, but, so, but anyway, these experiments on this uh, particular bacteria in NLCs show some novel phenomenology. What is the novel phenomenology? Basically, what these guys find is that you can channel active matter to move in a pre-designated direction. That, that's, that's the sort of key component of these experiments. I think they were primarily done by the group of Labrento, Labrento and Company. And uh, so, for example, here's a liquid crystal configuration with a plus half and a minus half defect. And the authors showed uh, that the bacteria migrate from the minus half defect to the plus half defect, okay? So it sort of gives you the possibility of making your active matter do what you want it to do by choosing an appropriate uh, uh, liquid crystalline configuration. Here's another example from these papers. That's the liquid crystal configuration. There's a vortex at the center. And they find that the bacteria sort of, because of uh, following this vortex, sort of execute a circular motion again. So again, the idea is to get some sort of handle on what your active matter is doing, use it for delivery of drugs, use it for microfluidics and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, the sort of key component of the experiments is that the liquid crystal molecules are locally uh, parallel to the uh, active matter. That's, that's a sort of key physics and that's what makes uh, uh, the minus half defect repeller and so on and so forth basically, okay? So we got interested in this problem uh, about a year ago. So here's our sort of uh, uh, part B, that's the modeling of living liquid crystals and that's a paper that just came out a few months ago, okay? So uh, uh, we've already heard of the Landau uh, uh, Ginsburg free energy but let me sort of just run it past you again. Uh, there's your, so let's start off with the Landau de Gens free energy for li liquid crystals. This is there in this book, uh, I mean, in great detail, you can read about it in this book by de Gen and Prost. You have a liquid crystal, it's, the rods are typically aligned on the average. So the alignment direction is called the director, appropriately enough. And I'm considering a simple case where the liquid crystal is apolar. So there's an up-down symmetry in the director. And uh, you usually use this director to write a tensor order parameter, which has a magnitude, which is the uh, amount of ordering you have. I mean, the extent of ordering, it's, so that's uh, the magnitude of the order parameter. And then you have this term basically out here, which uh, I think Christina Marchetti also showed in her talk yesterday. So the bottom line is the following. Uh, that when S is zero, the rods are randomly oriented. When S is non-zero, the rad rods are oriented on the average. And in, in some units, S is equal to one when the rods are perfectly aligned, okay? Uh, I'm going to present things in two dimensions out here. So the model is uh, not, not specific to two dimensions. Uh, it's clear that this tensor is traceless. Well, first, the first let me say, the tensor is symmetric, so in two dimensions, uh, uh, if I have four components to start with, symmetry reduces B to three, right? And then additionally, it's also apparent if you just sort of do one line of algebra that it's traceless. So it basically says there are two quantities which define uh, the liquid crystalline order parameter. And in two dimensions, the trace of Q cubed is zero, and the sort of Landau degens free energy, which is, uh, uh, I think, uh, a takeoff from the land, usual Landau-Ginsburg free energy, is just some usual Landau expansion in terms of this order parameter, along with a penalty term for, uh, a penalty term which models the sort of uh, 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 variation of the order parameter spatially, okay? So, I, 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 as I said, you've seen this in several talks already. But I, I just want to uh, sort of uh, give you a pedagog pedagogical story to the extent possible, okay? And the kinetics you write down for this Ginsburg-Landau free energy 
is this usual TDGL uh, sort of uh, kinetics. In the TDGL kinetics, the order parameter just relaxes to its free energy minimum. And uh, that's it, basically. This is designated as model A in the classification scheme of uh, 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 Heilprin and Hohenberg. And this is also something that's arisen sort of several times already in the conference, OK? So this is my kinetic model for liquid crystals. Now let's look at the free energy for active matter. Well, let me start with the kinetic act model for active matter. The active matter is always out of equilibrium. So uh, the appropriate equations are the tonal two equations at the coarse strain level. And you have an equation for a density field and an equation for a polarization field, which is just the local direction of the uh, active matter, basically, of the bacteria, say. Okay? And uh, this review by Sriram, Christina, and others shows that you can actually write this in a manner akin to that of a Ginzburg-Landau free energy, though, though, though not, not quite the same. So, so that's the appropriate free energy uh, for active matters, if you will, as a function of the order parameters, which is the density and the polarization. And it has this usual Ginzburg-Landau kind of expansions, and then there are terms which are specific to active matter. And those enter the toner two equations as relaxational terms here with the conservation law, and as, as like model B, and relaxational terms here without a conservation law like model A. Okay, and these are sort of uh, additional advective derivatives due to the velocity. Okay, so that's uh, so far. I haven't told you anything new. Uh, I, we propose that a good model, a starting model for living liquid crystals, is where you combine uh, FQ, which is the free Landau de Gens free energy for liquid crystals, with FA, which is the free energy for active matter. And a term which aligns locally, N and P, OK? And, and the simplest term that respects the symmetry is N dot P, the whole squared. When N points parallel to P, that brings the free energy down, OK? So that, that's the coupling term we put in. Uh, it has an up-down symmetry. If you flip N, you, it's just sort of because of the square, you don't change the sign of this term, OK? And uh, uh, so basically what this term is going to do is going to align, uh, it's going to align the local order parameter to be parallel, uh, it's going to align the local mag, uh, uh, P to be parallel to the local N, basically. Okay, I put these back into my kinetic equations, which are um, TDGL equation for Q, and, uh, toner two, uh, and the toner two equations for rho and p. And finally, I'm, I'm writing this prescription in two dimensions. Here are the sort of resultant kinetic equations in all their sort of uh, uh, unpleasant glory, so to say. There are two kinetic equations for q11 and q12. And then there are two kinetic, so this is in two dimensions, as I told you. And there are kinetic equations for P1 and P2, which is the polarization of the active matter. And then finally, there's a continuity equation for the density field, OK? And uh, uh, let me just spend a few minutes on uh, uh, discussing this model. I don't want you to absorb every term of it. But uh, we do coarsely uh, studies with, these with, the, with this model. And in coarsely studies, you start off with a disordered initial condition. Uh, a disordered initial condition for the liquid crystal is the rods randomly oriented. And a disordered initial condition for the active matter is where, uh, where the sort of uh, bacteria are sort of randomly oriented and the density is uniform, OK? So for the moment, just drop out the coupling terms. So drop out these coupling terms out here. And uh, what happens in a coarsening experiment? Well, in a coasting experiment, the liquid crystal develops defects, which are vortices and anti-vortices and plus half and minus half defects. They move around, coalesce, et cetera, et cetera. This is something uh, we've uh, gained some understanding on in the last 20, 30 years, okay? So they finally relax 
to a homogeneous state where all the rods are aligned parallel to each other at zero temperature. Okay? Uh, so that happens when the temperature is below the critical temperature. So a typical coasting experiment, you start off above the critical temperature and quench below the critical temperature. That's how it works. Okay? What is the corresponding coasting experiment for the active matter? For the active matter, you start, uh, the active matter is disordered when the density, average density, rho zero, is less than the critical density, okay? So the disordered phase arises for rho zero less than rho c. So the ordering experiment would be you start off with a disordered phase where p1, p2 rho, uh, are zero plus minus fluctuations and rho is rho zero plus minus fluctuations and then watch the emergence of order, and again, you would have a coarsening state and so on and so forth, except you won't go to a, uh, you won't relax to a sort of a ground state in, in the active matter, so to say, okay? What do the coupling terms do? I, I want to sort of uh, make a couple of observations about the coupling terms. Uh, due to the form of our free energy, the coupling terms are all quadratic, okay? Which is to say that in the coarsening experiment, if you do a linear stability analysis about the disordered state, uh, it's the same as for, for the coupled equations as for the uh, sort of for uncoupled equations, basically, okay? Because these are quadratic terms when you do linear stability analysis around a, a zero state, so to say, you don't pick up any contributions from here, okay? That's the first observation. And the second observation is that, uh, uh, I mean, we've taken the simplest case where you have reciprocality, but in principle, you, a more general equation would involve writing sort of different coupling constants for the active matter affecting the liquid crystal and vice versa, okay? So, so, so these are various things that sort of uh, uh, one can do, okay? So these are the equations. I'm going to do coasting experiments with them, and I'm going to study here the steady state that arises. Uh, so that brings me to part C of my talk which is coupled kinetics in the phase diagrams. There are three cases of interest here. One is where the liquid crystal, so that, okay, let me just sort of enumerate these for you. Case one is where the liquid crystal is intrinsically disordered. That means in the uncoupled state, P is above Tc. So it's intrinsically disordered. And the active matter is intrinsically ordered which means rho is above rho c. So one of the components would like to order and the other component would not. And one wants to ask how the coupling is going to change that basically, okay? Uh, in case two, the liquid crystal is intrinsically ordered, which means you are below the critical temperature of the liquid crystal. And the active matter is intrinsically disordered, which means you're below the critical density. So rho zero is less than rho c, okay? And then you can have a case where both of them are intrinsically ordered. And of course, case four, where both of them are intrinsically disordered is not particularly interesting, as you can imagine, okay? So the first thing one always does when you are uh, confronted with such equations is to look for the fixed points. Basically, you just set del by del t equal to zero. You set grad squared equal to zero. And you get these uh, ugly coupled equations which actually turn out to be reasonably easy, easy to solve if you exploit rotational invariance. And uh, uh, here are the solutions for the various cases. I mean, the, the particular form is, is, is it's available in our papers and stuff. But I, the important thing is if you have these solutions, you can do linear stability analysis about them to understand uh, uh, the phase diagrams, okay? Okay, so now I'm going to look at some example from case one. Uh, uh, so case one, uh, it, let me remind you, is where the active matter is intrinsically ordered, which means rho zero is above rho c, and the liquid crystal is intrinsically disordered, which means the temperature is above the critical temperature. So the liquid crystal would like to be disordered. Here's a phase diagram of the active matter component. You can have a similar phase diagram for the liquid crystalline component. Uh, on the x-axis, I've plotted rho zero minus rho c. This is always positive because rho zero is greater than rho c. And uh, just let me remind you of the sort of lore from Toner 2 theory. Uh, uh, if, if you're looking at zero coupling, C0 equal to zero, which is on this axis, then you know the following, that a homogeneous 
ordered state exists everywhere along here, except that it becomes linearly unstable at some point, basically. Okay. So the way you would get that point is to find when the ordered homogeneous state becomes unstable. So at this lower values, you have this banded phase. And at uh, the higher values of rho 0 minus rho c, you have the ordered phase. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of uh, 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 the, the phase diagram, if you will, of the toner 2 model. Okay. As you hike the coupling constant, you find that the, the region of the banded phase expands, expands, and then finally starts to shrink. And, and, but the general structure is, is basically that you have a banded phase out here, and you have an ordered phase out here, and then you have some transition between it. Uh, let me quickly show you some snapshots. I'm not going to worry too much about coarsening out here. Uh, the theory, uh, as I said, has movies on that. I'm just going to focus on the final state that arises. So uh, what I'm plotting in this is from a 2D simulation. This is the, the frame for active matter. The density field is plotted by this color bar. And P vector are the white arrows basically out there. And the magnitude of the white arrows is proportional to the magnitude of P. Okay? So wherever you don't see any white arrows, it's not because we haven't plotted them, but because the order is too small to see, basically. So you start off from a random initial condition. And uh, sure enough, that uh, undergoes some coarsening process and ends up in this banded state with a band sweeping around uh, the system. This is something that uh, uh, has been around for a while. If you in, uh, so that's at earlier time, that's at a later time. If you look at the snapshot for a larger value of the coupling constant, you find the band is larger. And actually, we find that this, the band width uh, diverges as you approach uh, as you approach this line, basically. Okay. So obviously, the band diverges when you have a fully ordered state. Okay. What is the liquid crystal doing with the coupling now? Okay, remember it's intrinsically disordered. It would just like to die, but because of its coupling to the order, to the active matter, it actually sort of uh, picks up structure, which obviously mimics that structure. Here I'm plotting the act order parameter S. The order parameter is yellow, where I have regions of high order, and green, where I have regions of low order, basically. Okay. So there, sure enough, I pick up uh, uh, some sort of structure out here, mimicking that, and finally go into a banded state for the liquid crystal. And this banded space, uh, state sweeps around with the banded state of the active matter. I have a high density ordered phase. And there I have the green is the, uh, sorry, there's no density out here. I have a high alignment ordered phase and a low alignment disordered phase outside. If I increase the coupling constant, this uh, sort of becomes larger and sort of diverges as C approaches uh, the critical point. Uh, Sanjay, yes. there are two, there are distinct pneumatic and polar bands, is it? And yeah. they, they yeah. move, they both, they both travel. I see. So, I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, just to stress the point that the liquid crystal would have rather died without the coupling. Right, right, but actually, it's sort of activated in some sense by the coupling. Yeah, and it's somehow, even though it is itself a, a polar, it picks up a velocity because of the polar. exactly. I see. <laughs> okay, so that's that's a sort of a, a snapshot from case one, a typical snapshot from case one. Uh, 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 let me sort of look at uh, uh, another example from case two. I have about five minutes. Huh? Two minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll be done. So, uh, so here's a typical snapshot from case two. Let me remind you what case two is. The active matter is intrinsically disordered, which means the average density is less than the critical density. And the liquid crystal, crystal is intrinsically ordered, which means, I've written this wrong, it should be T less than Tc. Okay? So the coasting experiment in the uncoupled system will drive the liquid crystal to order and will basically kill uh, the active matter uh, if you start off from a random initial condition. So here's a sketch of the phase diagram. In this case, rho 0 is less than rho c. So I just have negative values of rho 0 minus rho c. In the uncoupled case, which is c0 equal to 0, the active matter dies. It's in the disordered phase. As I increase the coupling strength, 
I make a transition to an ordered state. And again, there's this sort of a window in the middle where the ordered state is destabilized into a banded plus uh, what we call solitonic state. Okay, so I'm looking at random disordered initial conditions. If I'm sitting somewhere down here, the active matter is not able to come alive. If I'm sitting up there, the active matter does come alive, as a matter of fact, due to the coupling. And I'm going to look at a parameter value somewhere in there where I have these banded plus soliton type of states, okay? So that's my next snapshot. Uh, again, I'm sort of following the same convention. convention. Uh, that's the uh, a plot of the density of active matter on a color scale. And the white arrows indicate uh, the direction of the active matter, okay? So basically what I find is, and, and this sort of blue region is low density and low order also, basically, okay? So what I find is a rather a sort of exotic state in this case. What I find is that there's this sort of lump of localized uh, order which sort of moves in this direction. The, the, the direction is not, I mean, it could be any direction, but that's just for this, this particular initial condition. It moves in this direction, collides with these two lumps of, again, uh, localized order. They undergo a complicated nonlinear interaction and then come out uh, intact, okay? This integrity of a nonlinear solution under collision is what's usually termed as a soliton. And uh, most examples of soliton in soliton physics are one plus one dimensional, okay? Uh, like the KDB soliton and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and so on and so forth. This is actually an example of a 2D soliton. I don't claim that this is a, a system with uh, infinite degrees of freedom as solitonic systems usually have, but obviously there's some kind of uh, uh, conservation laws, large number of conservation laws, which enable this complex uh, uh, sort of collision to, uh, it enables this sort of blob to survive this complex collision and it just keeps going round and round. Uh, Aditya has a movie of this, which he'll be happy to show you at his poster. What's happening to the act, uh, uh, to, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I should have said the active matter was disordered intrinsically. So it's actually come alive because of the coupling of with liquid crystals. What's happening to the liquid crystals? Well, I have a similar localized band of high order. Here, of course, everything is ordered, the sort of uh, reach, uh, the, uh, because I'm below the critical temperature. So you have a region of high order, high order, high order. This guy moves in this direction, same complicated nonlinear interaction, comes out at the end of the collision uh, with the uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 intact, uh, all, all the sort of lumps are intact. And as a matter of fact, this goes on for as much time uh, as we can follow this experiment, basically. So as I said, I've just showed you the steady state outcome. I have not shown you the coarsening that leads to it. Uh, that's yet another story. Uh, but I, but let, I, I'll just focus on the steady states today. Okay, so that actually brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Uh, so our target was the following. I took these li living liquid crystals and I formulated a Ginzburg-Landau model for them. Uh, the Ginzburg-Landau model is justified when the scale of pattern formation is significantly larger than the microscopic scale of the objects that you're looking at, okay? The important thing about our modeling is both components are treated on somewhat equal footing in that the liquid crystal can drive the active matter and the active matter can also drive the liquid crystal. Uh, unlike the, uh, the earlier works of Lavrentovich where the liquid crystal was there in a very dilute state. Okay, second statement. In our modeling, the active particles align parallel to the pneumatic liquid crystal but it's very easy to generalize the model to, uh, to prefer active matter being at an arbitrary angle to liquid crystals. I mean, for example, you can imagine if you had minus C0 replaced by plus C0, then the rods and the uh, velocity vectors would be perpendicular to each other, okay? Uh, we've studied the phase diagram and kinetics of this model. Uh, you can get all the boundaries sort of analytically just by doing lin linear stability analysis about fixed points. And Sort of the most interesting observation is that the observed ordered component can drag the disordered component into, well, chimera is just an, another name for banded, 
and two-dimensional solitron states. And, and we're still investigating this model and seeing where we can go with it. Uh, one last observation before I stop. Uh, our current interest is focused on seeing what boundary conditions do. Okay. Can you tailor structures in, okay, can you uh, fix boundary conditions to be either homeotropic or I think planar is, is what they're called, and can you fix structures uh, to do certain things in, in these systems, both active matter and the liquid crystals? Uh, that's our current focus of interest, and uh, I, I can answer some uh, questions, I guess, yeah. Thank you. Is there any chance of reducing the equations in some regime into some already known integrable system types of equations so you can find you know, that this is really a solid on? Yeah. And your lumps really seem to keep there. The, and so the, the, there must be some reduced description where it is. I mean, yeah. I, this is something we, we, we are looking at as a matter of fact, yeah. Uh, of course, I, I could say that solid on like behavior. See, normally in the classical solid ons, KDV and all that, you have this beautiful structure of a completely integrable infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a whole machinery that right. goes with them. Uh, I don't know whether such a thing would apply in a dissipative system like ours, uh, but it's worth a shot. And even if one doesn't find infinite conservation laws, one might find a large number of conservation laws, mm -hmm. which in classical mechanics anyway gives you a regular dynamics. If you have enough action angle, uh, whatever, uh, conserve. Well, that's still infinite in the field, yeah. really, but anyway, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so this is something we're looking at, as a matter of fact, yeah. Please. So these solitons have been seen in Vickshack model, in kinetic equations, and also in Toner 2. I think the only clearly published one is by Irvin Frey by simulations of Boltzmann equation for Vickshack, but it carries over to the right. Vickshack model itself and Tonneau 2 equations also. And they call it uh, band lanes. Band yeah. lanes? Yeah. Anyway. But are they, uh, are they the one-dimensional case? I remember this is a Toner paper where he talks about one-dimensional solitary wave solutions. No, no. I'm just, or this is in higher dimensions, huh? This is, this is 2D, all 2D. Huh? Two dimensions. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, uh, I was wondering, I mean, this active particles in mimetic are also supposed to create some f uh, flows. In 2D, it's OK to um, consider uh, not dry active uh, matter. Yeah, yeah so momentum conservation is, is not, yeah. it's not so important, I think. But still, I was wondering if like serum uh, vibrated rods in a 2D fluid, mm. there are some flows mm. which decays quickly. But they do affect the neighbors, hmm. and is it uh, is, is is one can think of like putting that effect effectively onto the pneumatic? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, yeah. Uh, for the moment, the models are sort of at a de in a dense limit where uh, uh, dry is okay. But obviously, if you go to a diluter level, try to explain the experiments. I think the hydrodynamics would be important. It's easy enough to work in in a framework. What one can understand out of that framework is what one uh, has to see. Basically, I guess. Yeah. Effect of that flow created by P on Q. Yeah. In it should be studied. Way. Yeah, in a simplified way. Yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with this. Yeah. Last question. Case one, you showed that there was this non monotonous dependence in the. Between the order and the band state. That's right. Yeah. So why is it re-entering? Uh, so if you increase C zero. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you go from here, you sort of uh, if you have rho zero minus rho c here, you're in the ordered state. It becomes banded, and then you come back into the ordered state, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But is is it a an, an simple reason why well, this is why? the only case I think that it was yeah. non-monotonous? Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, it comes out of a linear stability analysis. I don't have a good physics uh, answer for it, perhaps. Huh? But see, uh, the same argument that gives this point of transition can actually be used. You can do the linear stability analysis to get that entire line of boundary. And uh, that's not very sort of uh, transparent in terms of the physics of it, basically. OK, let us uh, thank the speaker again.